بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم أعزائي الطلبة Our subject is about infectious group The group is a heterogeneous group of mainly acute and infectious process mainly acute and infectious process but it could be non-infectious and not acute it is characterized by barking cough and may be associated with hoarseness, citrider, and respiratory distress. What is citrider? Citrider is a harsh, high-pitched respiratory sound, which is usually inspiratory, but it could be inspiratory and expiratory. It is produced by turbulent airflow. It is not a diagnosis, but it is a sign of upper airway obstruction. So citrider, it is a sign of upper airway obstruction and it is not a diagnosis. While a croup is a diagnosis and it is mainly acute and infectious process. Croup typically affects the larynx, trachea, and the bronchi. Larynx, trachea, and the bronchi. Laryngeal and the tracheal infections will cause mucosal inflammation and the swelling. And this can rapidly cause a life-threatening obstruction of the upper airway in the young children. Several conditions can cause upper airway obstruction in young children and infants. And these are mainly characterized by barking cough, barking cough, citrider, hoarseness, and variable degrees of dyspnea. What are the differential diagnoses of acute upper airway obstruction? Or what are the causes of upper airway obstruction in young children and infants? The most common cause is the viral laryngotracheal bronchitis, which is called the croup, and other causes including the epiglottitis, laryngitis, bacterial tracheitis, retropharyngeal abscess, diphtheria, infectious mononucleosis, laryngeal foreign body, trauma to the throat, inhalation of smoke and hot air, allergic laryngeal angioedema, and hypocalcemia. So the most common cause is the viral laryngotracheal bronchitis, and don't forget other causes, like the epiglottitis, which is a serious disease, and don't forget the laryngeal foreign body, and also don't forget hypocalcemia, especially in infant. Severe obstruction can lead to increasing the respiratory rate, increasing the heart rate, and agitation. Central cyanosis and the drowsiness indicate a severe hypoxemia and the need for urgent intervention. And the most reliable objective measure of hypoxemia is by measuring the oxygen saturation by using the pulse oximetry. This is an important point. Total obstruction of upper airway may be precipitated by examination of the throat by using a tongue debrasor. So one must avoid looking at the throat of a child with upper airway obstruction unless full resuscitation equipment and personnel are at hand for urgent intervention so don't hurry in examination of the throat in a patient presented with sign of upper airway obstruction because you may precipitate a complete upper airway obstruction what is the basic management of acute upper airway obstruction number one don't forget don't examine the throat unless all the equipment are available for urgent intervention. Number two, reduce the anxiety of the child and the family by being calm, confident, and well organized. You have to be a well organized. Number three, observe carefully for signs of hypoxia or deterioration. For example, presence of cyanosis, or disturbed level of consciousness, like drowsiness. 
Number four, give humidified oxygen and then a treatment of the underlying cause accordingly. For example, in severe crew, administer nobilized epinephrine and contact the anesthetist if respiratory failure develops from an increasing airway obstruction, exhaustion, or secretion blocking the airway, urgent tracheal intubation may be required. Now, crew laryngotracheobronchitis. It is a viral infection of the glutic and subglutic region in the larynx. So it is a viral disease. Etiology of a crew. Most acute infections of upper airway are caused by viruses. And the most common virus is the parainfluenza viruses. Parainfluenza viruses type 1, 2, and 3 account for about 75% of the cases. Other viruses can cause in the group including the influenza A virus and influenza B virus, adenovirus, respiratory syncytial virus, and measles virus. Influenza A has been associated with severe type of group, while mycoplasma pneumonia has rarely been isolated from children with a croup and can cause a mild disease. So the most common cause of the infectious croup is the parainfluenza virus. Epidemiology. Most patients with a croup are between the age of six months and five years with a big age of incidence in the second year of life. The incidence of a croup is higher in boys than in girls. It, is occur it occurs most commonly during autumn and winter, so it is a seasonal disease, but it can occur throughout the year. Recurrences are frequent, and approximately 15% of the patients having a strong family history of a croup. What about the clinical manifestations of a patient with a croup? Most patients having a prodromal period of rhinorrhea, pharyngitis, mild cough, and low-grade fever for one to three days. Then the child develops the characteristic parking cough and may be associated with strider and hoarseness. The low-grade fever may persist, although the temperature sometimes reaching to 39 or 40 degrees centigrade, and some children are febrile. Symptoms are characteristically worsen at night and often recur with a decreasing intensity for several days and resolve completely within one week. Agitation and the crying greatly aggravate the symptoms and signs. The child may prefer to sit up in the bed or be held in upright position. Physical examination of a child with a croup can reveal horse voice, strider, parking cuff, slightly increased respiratory rate, and variable degrees of respiratory distress according to the severity of the disease, normal to moderately inflamed pharynx. Occasionally, it is difficult to differentiate severe laryngotracheobronchitis from epiglottitis, although the usual more acute onset and rapid course of the epiglottitis. The child who is hypoxic, cyanotic, pale, or obtended needs immediate airway management. How to diagnose a case of a croup? A croup can be diagnosed clinically and does not require X-ray of the neck. X-ray of the neck can show typical subglutic narrowing, which is called stipple sign or pencil sign on PA view. However, the stipple sign may be absent in patients with a croup and sometimes it is present in individuals without a croup as a normal variant. 
radiography should be considered only after stabilization of the airway in children who have an atypical presentation. Radiography may help to distinguish between severe laryngotracheobronchitis and epiglottitis, but the airway management should always take priority. So don't send the patient to the x-ray department unless you stabilize the airway. So you have to stabilize the general condition before sending the patient to the x-ray if required. This is the posterior anterior view, x-ray of the neck showing what is called the stable sign. And as I said, sometimes the stable sign is not present in a patient with a croup and sometimes it is a present in normal individual. Treatment. The mainicity of a treatment is the airway management and the treatment of the hypoxia. Treatment of the respiratory distress should take priority over any testing. This is a very important. Don't forget treatment of the respiratory distress and the airway obstruction should take priority over any test. Most children with the either acute spasmodic group or infectious group can be managed safely at home. What about the corticosteroid in the treatment of the viral group? The effectiveness of the oral corticosteroid in viral group is well established even in mild cases as measured by it reduces the hospitalization, it shortens the duration of hospitalization if required admission to the hospital, and it reduces the need for subsequent intervention such as epinephrine administration. Oral dexamethasone used in a single dose of 0.6 mg per kg and as low as 0.15 mg per kg. Oral dosing of dexamethasone is as effective as intramuscular administration. What are the indications of admission in a case of croup? If the patient with the croup presented with severe citrider at rest, or presented with progressive citrider, or presented with respiratory distress, hypoxia, cyanosis, or depressed mental status, or poor oral intake, or the patient require a reliable observation. These are indication of admission in a patient with croup. At hospital, nebulized resmid epinephrine is an accepted treatment for moderate or severe croup, and a dose of 0.15 to 0.5 mol of 2.25 percent rhythmic epinephrine in a 3 mol of normal saline can be used as often as every 20 minutes. L epinephrine 5 mol of 1 to 1000 solution is equally effective as rhythmic epinephrine and, and does not carry the risk of additional adverse effects. Nobilized epinephrine should still be used cautiously in a patient with tachycardia, heart conditions such as tetralogy of fallot or ventricular outlet obstruction because of possible side effects. The indication of administration of nobilized epinephrine include moderate to severe citrider at rest, respiratory distress, hypoxia and the possible need for intubation. The duration of activity of rhythmic epinephrine is less than two hours, therefore observation is mandatory in a patient required or receiving nebulized epinephrine. Antibiotics are not indicated in a group because as we said croup is a viral disease and the antibiotic it does not act on the viruses. A helium oxygen mixture, helox, may be effective in children with severe croup for whom intubation is being considered. 
now what are the indications of discharge of a patient to the crew if the patient have no strider at rest if the patient have normal air entry normal pulse oximetry normal level of consciousness the patient have received steroid can tolerate oral intake and caregiver understand or educated parents if these are present so you can safely discharge the patient home what about complications of croup complications occur in about 15 percent of patients with the viral croup and the most common is extension of the infectious process to other regions of the respiratory tract such as the middle ear terminal bronchioles and the lung barenchyme so it can be complicated to otitis media bronchiolitis pneumonia and cervical lymphadenitis bacterial tracheitis may be a complication of viral croup rather than a distant disease rarely meningitis or septic arthritis can occur in the course of the epiglottitis not croup not the croup in the epiglottitis epiglottitis can be complicated to meningitis or aseptic arthritis mediastinal emphysema or pneumothorax are the most common complications of tracheostomy and thank you for listening